Have you been going around the same mountain for the last 25 years? And you're just too stubborn to do things God's way. Are you ready to get beyond that? Somebody with a perfect heart is somebody who really, really, really wants to grow. They want to change. I was thinking not too long ago about 2 Chronicles 16, 9 that says the eyes of God roam to and fro across the earth looking for someone in whom he might show himself strong. And then it says, whose heart is perfect toward him. I'm really glad that scripture doesn't say the eyes of God roam to and fro across the earth looking for someone in whom he might show himself strong who has a perfect performance. I spent enough years in my life trying to perform perfectly, thinking, well, maybe the better I was, the more God could do for me, or maybe the better I was, I could get a breakthrough that I desired. And it was really good news to me, and I hope good news to you, that God is looking around the earth for someone that he might work through, someone that he might bless, someone that he might show himself strong through. And he's not looking for someone that has a perfect performance because there are really none of those that exist. He's looking for someone who has a blameless, a right, and a perfect heart. Matter of fact, I happen to know from scripture and from experience that God would rather have someone who makes a few mistakes but has a really right heart than someone who does everything right. I mean, they are so super religious, they have got it all together, they keep all the rules, all the regulations, but they've got a stinky, lousy, bad heart attitude. God is not as concerned with us having a perfect performance as we might think that he is. I always like to tell people, you're no surprise to God, he knew what he was getting when he got you. I'm no surprise to God. He knew what he was getting when he got me. He didn't say, okay, Joyce, now shape up or ship out. Actually, I do things that surprise me, and I have to remember that God is not surprised. He knew about it before he ever allowed me to have a relationship with him through Jesus Christ. But I think a lot of times, you know, we hear people say, and we say, well, my heart's right, my heart's right, my heart's right. And if there's a perfect heart that can be had, I want to have one, and I'm sure you're the same way. So I began to just think about some of the characteristics of a perfect heart. And to be honest, God gave me this little message. It didn't take very long at all. And I'm going to invite you tonight to examine your heart. I'm going to invite you tonight with each one of these points to ask yourself kind of where you're at in that area. Is that an area that you need to really begin to pray about and you need to ask God to help you grow in? Because we do want to make sure that our hearts are right toward God. And I can say that if the more right our hearts are, the more right our performance will be. But see, you can polish up your performance and still have a stinky heart attitude. But if you have a really good heart toward God, a really right heart. I mean, you really love God. You want to be what God wants you to be. You want to serve God. You want to help people. That goes a long, 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 long way with God. Don't you like to be around people that you can tell just have a really good heart? How many of you like that? You just, and I'm not talking about their physical heart beats strong. I think a lot of times when we talk about heart, we can replace that word with attitude. Many times what's in our heart comes out in our attitude. So the first thing I'd like to talk to you about is I believe a person with a perfect heart is always growing spiritually. Are you growing? Are you different this year than you were last year? Do you behave better, although you're not perfect? Do you behave better now than you did five years ago or 10 years ago? Or are you still in that situation that I found myself in many years ago where I went to church on a regular basis and I believe that Jesus died for me? I can actually tell you that I really believe if I would have died, I would have gone to heaven. 
I knew I was saved by grace and not by works. But I can tell you that I was not growing. I went to church and went home and nothing changed. I went to church and went home and nothing changed. I went to church and went home and nothing changed. Our relationship with God is not about a Sunday morning event. It's not about 45 minutes or an hour or an hour and a half that we spend in a building going through a certain form or method or ritual, but it's about letting God into every single area of our lives. It's about growing. And I can tell you that if you go to church on a regular basis and you're not growing, then either there's something wrong with the church you're going to or there's something wrong with you. And if I were you, I would find out which one it is. And if it's you, then you need to repent and tell God it's time for you to shape up and to just pour it on. And if it's the church and they're not teaching you anything, then you need to just go somewhere else where you can really be challenged by the Word of God, hear the full gospel, the truth of God's Word. You don't need to just be made to feel good every time you go to church. Sometimes you need to be confronted. Sometimes you need to have your little spiritual bottom paddled. Sometimes you need to be corrected. In the midst of all of that, we also need to be encouraged. We need to love, be loved. We need to be edified. Go somewhere where you can get the strong meat of the Word, not just a pacifier and a milk bottle every week, week after week after week after week. If you're not in the right place where you're growing, then you need to get somewhere where you are growing. I'm sure we'd all like to think if we're not growing, it's the church, but first I would start with you. I would make sure that you're doing what you're hearing in church, because no matter what you hear, if you don't do it, you're not going to grow. I said, no matter what you hear in church, if you don't do it, you're not going to grow. No matter what you hear here tonight, if you don't do it, you're not going to grow. And God will help you do it. There's two phrases I want you to get rid of. I can't help it. And it's just too hard. You need to get rid of both of those phrases. Anything that God tells us to do, He's going to give us the strength and the ability to do it if we cry out to Him and lean on Him. We have to stop saying, it's just too hard. It's just too hard. I just can't help it. I just can't help it. Those are power-stealing excuses that will keep us right in the same place and will never grow. What you need to say is, I can do whatever God tells me to do through Christ who strengthens me. Now, you know, I used to really worry about this thing with a perfect heart because I would hear people preach and, you know, God wants us to be perfect. Be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. We're going to put that up on the screen and I want you to see what the Amplified Bible says. You, therefore, must be perfect. Now, right about there, I'm going, oh, I'm in trouble. But I love this. Growing into complete maturity of godliness in mind and character, having reached the proper height of virtue and integrity as your heavenly Father is perfect. So we have God here who is perfect. He's our example. And we are to press toward that mark. The Apostle Paul said he pressed toward the mark of perfection. If you don't want to have improvement in your behavior, then something's desperately wrong in your heart. And I'm sure you all do or you wouldn't be here in this building tonight. Most of you, if you've lasted past the first two minutes of this TV program, you're interested in something changing in your life, you're interested in something growing or you're just waiting to see if I'm crazy or a nutcase or whatever, but you know, if you'll just hang on long enough, maybe God will be able to put something in your heart that might make a real huge difference for you. I want to be perfect in my behavior, but I know that I only get there in degrees of glory. I study, God deals with me, I repent, I pray, I study some more, I trust God, and then pretty soon I see some changes. And that's been going on for 35 years, and I don't expect it to ever stop. If you think that you're ever going to get to the point where God's not going to be dealing with you about something, then you are seriously mistaken. 
And you best hope that never happens because the worst thing that could ever happen to you would be for God to leave you alone and let you stay the way you are. Amen. Paul said, I've not arrived at the place of perfection, but I've pressed toward it. And one of the things he said is that he let go of what lies behind and pressed toward the good things that are ahead. And we're going to talk about that in just a minute. 1 Peter 2, 2 says, desire God's word and grow unto completed salvation. There's nothing that I love better than the sound of about 10,000 people in a building with the Bible pages turning when I say turn to a certain scripture. Those are people who desire the Word of God. There's nothing more beautiful than as early as you possibly can to go get your Bible and to let the Word of God begin to minister to you. Today on the plane, I was just flipping through Psalms, and I've got a lot of stuff underlined in my Bible like I'm sure a lot of you do. I was actually looking for a scripture that I wanted to share. But while I was going through, I was just rereading some of my favorite scriptures and I can honestly tell you, I just felt like I was being fed. It's just like the Word of God is the most amazing thing in the world because it's not just normal words, it's words packed with the power and the presence and the anointing of God. Jesus is the Word made flesh. So when you go to the Word of God, you're actually communicating with and fellowshipping with Jesus Himself. In Ephesians 4, 10 through 12, the Bible says that God has given ministry gifts to us. Apostle, prophet, pastor, evangelist, teacher. Ministry gifts that we might grow and that we might mature, that we might go out and do the work of the ministry. God has given you pastors to teach you, to help you change. He's given you teachers to teach you and to help you change. Are you growing? Have you been going around the same mountain for the last 25 years and you're just too stubborn to do things God's way? Are you ready to get beyond that? Somebody with a perfect heart is somebody who really, really, really wants to grow. They want to change. They ask God to change them. They ask God to examine them and to show them areas of their life where they might change. A person with a perfect heart doesn't find something wrong with everybody else while they think that they've already arrived. I remember when I was back in just my church going days, going to church and going home, going to church and going home, nothing changing. And when God touched my life and I began to study the word, I wanted to apply all of it to Dave. The more I read, the more problems I knew that Dave had. <laughs> Come on now. I was praying for Dave to change. I was furiously praying for Dave to change. And God actually spoke to my heart and said, Dave is not the problem. And I didn't know who in the world it was because it never occurred to me that it was me. So before you start trying to change anybody else, come on now, before you start trying to change anybody else, you better make sure that you're growing and that you're asking God to change you. The second thing I believe that we will see in a person with a perfect heart is they are fully, fully committed. No lukewarmness, no lazy ho-hum, half-baked attitude. God is not pleased with anybody who is halfway to where he wants them to be. Halfway is not good enough. We've got to go all the way through with God. Too many people start off in the right direction. They're going to work with God to conquer this problem or that problem in their life or to overcome this or that. And it's good as long as they're just talking about it. But as soon as it comes to a little bit of discomfort, a little bit of pain of sacrifice then all of a sudden they go back where they came from you got to stop quitting when the going gets rough 
You got to press through because on the other side of that pain is a victory. You can have the pain of discipline today or you can have the pain of regret tomorrow. Which is it going to be? I said to someone just again this past week, I don't think there's anything sadder to me than to see an elderly person who you know only has a few years left to live and all they have from their life is regret. That doesn't have to be you if you start doing something about it right now. You need to make good choices right now. Discipline doesn't always feel good. It's not always joyous right now. But later on, it yields a harvest in our lives if we'll make those right choices. Romans chapter 12, verse 1, I think says what I'm trying to say very well. I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, and I beg of you, in view of all the mercies of God, to make a decisive dedication of your bodies, presenting all your members and faculties, all, all your members and faculties. That means your eyes, your ears, your mouth. God wants you to be committed to not listen to junk. He wants us to be committed to not listening to gossip and slander and backbiting and people telling tales. He'd like you to be committed to not listening to somebody at the lunch table tell a filthy, dirty joke and then laughing about it because you really don't want to seem to be not part of the group. You're too quiet. He wants us to be fully committed. He doesn't want us just to go to church on Sunday and have this Sunday morning thing with God and then the rest of the week be the kind of people that nobody can even tell that we have a relationship with God. We have to be dedicated, consecrated. The word consecrated means set apart for God's use. And I'm going to ask people tonight before this is over, if you've not made a full commitment to Christ. See, we had an altar call here earlier and lots of people Lots of people, hundreds and hundreds, raised their hands, said they wanted to receive Christ as their Savior. But are you ready to be fully committed? Fully committed. There's a lot of great people in here tonight that are very committed, but there are people in here tonight that you've never even given that much thought to being fully committed. Like I said earlier, we can't just take Jesus and tack him onto our selfish, sinful, silly lifestyle and think that's our free ticket to heaven. We need to be committed. And, and our way into heaven is not according to our good works, but I have to tell you honestly, if you have a right relationship with God, you just absolutely cannot help yourself. You want to grow. And if you don't want to grow, then there's a heart problem. And if you don't want to be committed, then there's a heart problem. Something is wrong if you don't want to be fully committed. And I was a Christian for many years before I was fully committed. Would I have gone to heaven? Yes, I believe that I would have. But you know what? I wouldn't be helping you tonight. I wouldn't have had the breakthroughs and the victories that I've had in my life. Being a Christian is just not about whether or not you could squeak in the back door of heaven. It's how are you going to live your life? How are you going to live your life? What shall we do now? I tell you, I am so worn out with the world and the way that people act and everybody acting like God is an enemy and trying to get rid of him and everything. Oh, it's just aggravating me more and more every day that I live. I'm just weary of hearing about wars and rumors of wars and, and riots and all these disasters and terrible things that are going on. How much I crave to see people in mass cry out to God and turn back to God. It's obvious that things are going to go straight downhill until we cry out to God again. It doesn't take a bunch of panels of geniuses to try to figure this out. It is not hard. As soon as people will get fully committed to God, things will begin to turn around in your life. And if you are not fully committed, then like Paul said, to the Romans, I beg you in view of all the mercies of God to make a decisive dedication of all of your members and faculties. Dedicate your money. 
Dedicate your time. And boy, when you talk, start talking about money and time, people get... Well, you wouldn't have anything anyway if God didn't give it to you. So why are you so afraid he might ask for a little bit of it? Whatever God asks you to give, he's never trying to take anything away from you. He's just trying to get you to sow a seed so he can bring a bigger harvest in your life. It is foolish to not obey God when it comes to giving. How can we say that our heart is full of God and never want to give? Giving and Christianity cannot be separated. Giving your time, giving help, giving compliments, giving encouragement. You need to live to give. Make a decisive dedication. Make a decision tonight. I'm not going to be a lazy, lukewarm, halfway, hope to sneak in the back door Christian. Hold nothing back. Be fully committed. Be committed to growing. Be committed to serving. Be committed to giving. Be committed to the Word of God. The Bible says that when sacrifices are offered unto God from someone who is not dedicated, they are dead sacrifices. In other words, if you go to church on Sunday and you put a little bit in the offering and maybe you, maybe you serve on a committee, maybe you do some ushering or some greeting or you show up at work day once every three months, and, but really you're not dedicated to God. Your mind is not dedicated to God. You think all kinds of garbage stuff. Your mouth isn't dedicated to God. You sit and gossip like everybody else. Or I do. We won't blame it all on you. I can be the same way. You're not dedicated. Sometimes I have to rededicate. I'll get real strong in an area and then I'll find myself slipping. Today I heard myself having an attitude about something and I thought, now, Joyce, you know better than that. I had to go back to my room and repent. I had to get it right with God again. And I had to rededicate that attitude in that area. There's nothing wrong with that. We don't arrive at that place of perfection, but God sees your heart. If you really crave to do what's right. Let me tell you something. If you don't think you ever do anything wrong, you are a sad case. If it's really hard for you to say I'm wrong, then you need to get on your knees and start praying double time and triple time. You need to get good at saying I'm wrong. I'm wrong. I'm wrong. That don't make you wrong as a person, but we need to admit when our behavior is not right. 1 Peter 2, 9 says we are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a dedicated nation. We are called to perfection and to excellence. Well, I think we all need to ask ourselves on a regular basis, what's in my heart? You know, I can want to be used by God in outward acts, but not willing to serve God inwardly. By that, I mean a person could go to church dutifully every Sunday and yet still keep a lot of judgmental thoughts on the inside. And God is really concerned about our hearts. He's not looking just for an outward performance, but he's looking for someone with a right and a perfect heart. This little boy's name is Wawin, and he's nine years old. And when he was six years old, he'd already been working in the dumps for quite a long time, digging trash out of the dumpster that could be sold for 50 or 60 cents a day. Here in Cambodia's capital, the city of Phnom Penh. When the pastor came to this village and wanted to start a school, his parents would not let him come to school at first because they couldn't afford to lose the money that he was making. But the pastor offered to pay them the same amount of money that he was actually making when he would go to work in the dump, and then they let him come to school on that basis. Well, after a short period of time, they saw such a change in him that they said, no, you don't have to pay us anymore. We want him to come to school there. So we're hoping to see the same kind of transition in hundreds and hundreds of children's lives. I don't believe that we can look at a tragic situation like this and do nothing. And I believe together, 
we can make a huge difference in a lot of children's lives. Thank you and God bless you. Ik was echt afhankelijk en was me daar niet van bewust. Ik wist niet eens dat ik zo op zoek was naar goedkeuring. En toch heb ik op de een of andere manier mijn leven lang geprobeerd het anderen naar hun zin te maken. Het lukte me maar niet om de persoon te zijn die anderen wilden dat ik was. En ik heb me altijd druk gemaakt over wat anderen van me denken. Ik snakte naar goedkeuring en ik geloof dat ik dat nog regelmatig doe. Ik geloof niet dat ik ooit echt mezelf was. Maar nu is het anders. In haar nieuwe boek Verslaafd aan Goedkeuring laat Joyce Meyer uitgebreid zien hoe jij je zelfbeeld kunt veranderen. Leer jezelf beter kennen en leer te accepteren hoe jij bent als persoon. Bestel nu Verslaafd aan Goedkeuring telefonisch op 026 20 22 100 of bezoek onze website joyce-meyer.nl Ga ook eens naar de Facebookpagina van Joyce Meyer Nederland. Like deze pagina en ontvang elke dag inspirerende uitspraken van Joyce op jouw Facebook. Open, direct en to the point. Kleine oases in je dagelijks leven. Lees mee, het is het waard. Alleen bij Joyce Meyer Nederland op Facebook.